What is it? What movie is it where um, uh, it's Doctor Strange when he's doing the surgery? Yeah. And he's like, cover your watch. <laughs> so the film. Hello and welcome to Our Professor Podcast. I am Micah Sander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm uh, Carter Green. And uh, today Carter and I are sharing a microphone. So there's that. But the main thing, you know, we didn't, we didn't come here to talk about microphones. The main thing is that uh, we sat down with Professor Fishman. Professor Louis Fishman is a historian of Palestinian and Israeli history during the late Ottoman period, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, modern Turkey, and late Ottoman history. He divides his time between New York, Istanbul, and Tel Aviv. He finished his BA at Haifa University and his MA and PhD at the University of Chicago. He is the author of Jews and Palestinians in the Late Ottoman Era, 1908 to 1914, Claiming the Homeland, and is currently working on a book on the history of today's Turkey. He regularly contributes to Haaretz, where he writes about Turkish and Israeli affairs, in addition to writing and providing political analysis to media outlets in Turkey, Israel, and the U.S. Sitting with us, we have one of Professor Fishman's students, and I would like to welcome Leal to our Professor Podcast. Leal, can I ask you, what is it like taking a class with Professor Fishman? Well, be prepared for really bad jokes. Um, <laughs> I think that it's really great to kind of see the way in which he structures history as kind of this narrative focusing on the people than it is narrative focusing on like institutions and how people divide, how institutions divided people. I think that's what's really fun about the class. He also makes it really lighthearted. You get to see his Twitter all the time. And it's just always engaging. It doesn't feel like a class, it feels like a conversation. And as a student, what can you expect workload-wise as well as assignments, readings? I think that workload-wise, it's not heavy. I think it also depends on the class that you're taking. So if you're taking a lower class, it's probably not going to be too crazy if you're taking like a colloquium that'll be different that'll be a different situation but i do believe that he is like lower to mid on the scale of classes very manageable i mean homework at least thank you Leal, so much for <laughs> for coming in and talking with us wherever you're listening whatever you're listening on whomever you're listening with strap in for a fantastic interview with the Brilliant, wise, esteemed Professor Louis Fishman. That was a good answer, right? Yeah, that was a really good answer. I'm so sorry. No, no, but I, I can, don't worry, so I can do it. dealing with amateurs, I'm sorry. I can, I can do it again. Okay, so start over again. One, two, three, take two. So why did you choose your area of study? Did it change over time? And was there a particularly important professor or mentor at any stage of your education? Thanks so much for having me. I originally went into Middle East history because I was interested in, in Middle East studies. I entered Haifa University uh, as a BA student. I had already done my prep program at Tel Aviv University. I got to Haifa. Haifa is a really interesting place. It has 20% Palestinian students there. They're citizens of the, of, of the state. I was very excited to learn Middle East history and hopefully to understand better the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So once I got there, I started a double major in Middle East where I did about 20 hours of Arabic a week. Um, and that was, it was an eye-opener. First of all, Arabic, we know that there's spoken Arabic and there's written Arabic. We're doing written Arabic. So that doesn't really help you meet other Arabs or speak or, you know, engage in Arabic. But over time, being at Haifa University, I also uh, developed more political activism, which actually was the reason I went. And I started already as someone young. Uh, after I had immigrated to Israel, I was involved in uh, leftist parties smaller parties. And I think that was a, a real change that everyone can find sort of their place in a parliamentary system that's very different than the, the U.S. system where you have sort of a two-party system. Later on in my life, I understood there's caucuses and there's different things like that, but I'm, I'm very removed from, from U.S. politics uh, overall. I started studying. It was great. But what I did not find was the history of Palestine. We had the history of the land of Israel. We had great studies on Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, 
And I decided at the end of my studies, finishing my degree, not just in Middle East studies in the end, but also in Israeli studies. There was two components of this. It was Israeli law and Israeli Labor Party studies. So I felt that I had that side down really well. And I ended up going to Chicago to do my PhD, my MA PhD, uh, where I studied with Rashid Khalidi, who is at Columbia now. He's sort of the most prolific writer on the history of Palestine. But once I got to Chicago, because I was in the Nelk Department, Near Eastern Language and Civilizations, I had to take early Islamic history and also modern history. I could choose which different things. Um, we had to do languages. They were very big on languages, so I did. I already had the Hebrew, so I continued with Arabic up to f fifth year. And then I started Turkish towards the end, which we'll get to in a second. So overall there, I was able to develop my Arabic studies through also, it's an orient, or orientalist department, but not in a bad way, in the sense that we had one of the best scholars, a woman scholar, Wadad al-Qadi, uh, teaching us uh, the Quran, for example. So I did a whole year class on the Quran, me and two other students, we're three students, and today they're top scholars in Quranic studies. So I was interested in this, but I never left my interest of Palestinian history. And that's really where I got to my topic, which we'll talk about in a second, which led to a book, so forth and so on. Now, in terms of, you know, how it's changed and who influenced me, well, of course, my professor, Rashid Khalidi, has greatly influenced me in a very, very good way, I would say. I had professors like uh, Boutrous Abulmani, that uh, may rest in peace. He was a scholar at Haifa University in late Ottoman studies. And really, I wasn't going into Ottoman studies. When I went to Chicago, I didn't think I was go going to go into Ottoman studies. And I had a professor who came to visit named Hassan Kayala. And he's at UC San Diego. And it was, a, it was transformative for me because I said, now I want to go back to the Ottoman period. But this was after I had already done four years of coursework. I'm one of the few people that did more coursework in graduate than undergraduate, because undergraduate in Israel is only three years. And I did four years of coursework on a quarter system at Chicago. So I did tons of classes, for better or for worse. I support the American system. I support that, that you know, when you're doing a PhD that you still have coursework in Britain. It's not like that. I think these are the years that you really grow as a, a scholar, as an academic. You start understanding your field and yourself much better. So that's where I got connected to Ottoman studies. And it really, I went to Istanbul in 1998 for a language course, and, and I've never really left it in that sense since 1998. I ended up moving there in 1999, and since 2003, when I bought a house there, I'm constantly going back and forth. So yeah, the, the, you know, if you ask how I've changed, I've changed a lot in the sense of my focus, what am I doing, what I write about. In the field, we can talk about, you know, how the field, the field has become much more expansive, I would say. Uh, it was much smaller when I first started. Today, there's many universities have Middle East programs. So I'm that generation that we fill the positions now where, you know, University of Iowa will have one and Nebraska will have a Middle East scholar. It wasn't like that 20 years ago. 20 years ago before 9-11, my, because that's when it came really popular in the United States, my Arabic class only had three students or four students. After 9-11, had, they opened three classrooms. You know what I mean? So this is, this is uh, the field's changed a lot since then, I would say. For the better also. Really, for the better in this sense. That's it. There's been arguments in the field of history where modern factors affect how we interpret history in all sorts of ways. As someone who works with journalism and modern things as well as history... How does your journalism affect your history work and vice versa? Yeah, thanks for the question. So I got a job here in 2007. And in 2012, I leave for briefly and then come back in 2013. In those years, I really started questioning different things in history. And I really wanted to be involved in what's happening today. I just or five minutes ago explained to you that I got into the field because I was interested in, in politics. Now, once I finished my dissertation... I really didn't touch the Palestinian-Israeli conflict for years. And Turkey seemed sort of like a, a comfortable way to talk about politics and to avoid that huge elephant in the room, which is the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But because I was writing my, my dissertation on it, and I needed a space from it. Then, around 
2012, 2013, I said, you know, I, I really want to go into journalism. I have interest in it. I started writing uh, for different newspapers. I ended up uh, becoming a contributing editor in Haaretz, the English edition, and I've written maybe 60 articles on Turkey since then, and about 10 on uh, Israel-Palestine. Plenty of people writing in Israel, both Palestinians and Israelis, writing on the conflict. And my time is, I'm going to shift back. I'm sh the last three or four years, I've been shifting back to that topic more, covering that topic more. But it's very personal. In Turkey, I don't vote, for example. In the Israeli elections, I do vote. So it's very different to write about a country and not vote for that country. You're freer to write, you're freer to think. Because when I go in to write politics in Israel, I still have some, some stake in it in terms of my own political party, which I'm very vocal about whether I support and which party I support and different things. So going back to your question, and I think that's how has it changed how I understood history? It really hasn't in a great extent, but it gave me space away from the history for a few years that when I came back in 2015 and 2016, I said, that's it, I'm finishing my book. I've transformed that dissertation in the book. I had enough years away from it. What, what, I think the problem in academia is that, you know, we finish our dissertation and they say, okay, now turn that into a book. You know, they all congratulate you after your dissertation. They say, you built this beautiful building. But now the same people literally a year later said, that building was nice, but maybe the second floor needs to be on the fifth floor. Maybe the fourth floor doesn't even need to be there. You know, uh, what you have in your conclusion should be in your introduction. That's what I understood later. And you're tired of the topic. I was literally tired of the topic. And that's where journalism gave me the space to develop writing about today. And, it, and you have instant results almost. You know, you write an article in 24 hours, you know what people think within 26 hours. It's that quick. And you're able to engage with people, talk with people, discuss issues. And you're able to influence. It's very important. I think my history writing influences. I think everyone, everyone's history has real world meanings for today. But that takes years sometimes for that to happen. You know, what I'm doing in my book, we can talk about in a second. I think five years, ten years down the road, people will start understanding the history different. So I think you know, when I went into studies, I was a little naive thinking, oh, you're going to write this and it's going to have, people are going to argue over it. No, there's other books, there's other, there's, it's within a greater debate. And so I, I do really niche Ottoman part, uh, late Ottoman Palestine. So there's you know, how many people work on it. I think journalism gave me that space, but it turned into something, I think, much more over time. I really enjoy it. I really enjoy writing, and it's helped me teach by far. You know, it's helped me grade papers. It's helped me to help students cut down. No one, today, no one wants to read an 800-page book. People don't have time. They want now, here and now, okay? So if you're able to cut down, you're able to clearly write, place an argument in that, because every article you write, I do op-eds, there's an argument embedded in that. And if you don't have argument, you know, then it's not worth it. Um, then it's not going to get published. So yeah, that's, that's how, it, that's how it's uh, shifted, I would say. To transition into the, the next question off of your answer, I almost said piggyback. I know it's you forbidden. despise you can, this word. Yeah. I despise the word. No student can say piggyback in my class. <laughs> Absolutely hate it. Oh. <laughs> it's very but, true. <laughs> but, uh, but in your, your book, Claiming the Homeland, you write that when, when writing histories of conflicts, we often read history backwards, projecting the realities of today back in time, leaving us with a skewed picture of how conflicts are formed and how they emerge. How do you undo people's assumptions of inevitability in the Israel-Palestine conflict today? And how does understanding these divisions as modern and not ancient or biblical impact popular perceptions of this area? This is, that, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, you really chose one of my favorite parts of the book. So you're right on. Listen, the narrative is too smooth. The narrative of Balfour Declaration, you know, of the first wave of immigration, first Aliyah, second wave of immigration, Balfour Declaration, uh, 36, 39, 1929, uh, Welling Wall or El Barak riots, upright, whatever you want to call it, 1936, 39, Holocaust, World War II, and 1948. It's, a too, it's way too smooth of a narrative. So what I say is that people actually started in 1948, and they said, how did we get here? Well, we'll go back to the Holocaust. And because we know that there was a Jewish issue before the Holocaust, 
the conflict existed before the Holocaust. And a state wasn't absolutely inevitable because of the, because of the Holocaust. That conflict was already there. There were already, in 1936, 500,000 Jewish people there. There were 30% of the population. Now, a lot of that is because of the British mandate. Not a lot of it. It is a direct result of that. But I found that the narrative was, so they go back. They started at 48. They go back to the World War II and the Holocaust. Then they go back to 36, 39. Then they go back to 1917. And they create this na narrative that, that really, they, they read the history backwards, I argue. By going to the late Ottoman era and reading the documents, I find that everything we learned about that period, we need to take it with a grain of salt within those nationalist narratives. I mean, the, the, the greater world events we know about, I'm not, no one's questioning that. The, but placing it within the Ottoman, placing Zionism within the Ottoman context, placing the Palestinians within that Ottoman context, you have a very, very different picture. A different picture emerges where Palestinians are actively trying to defend their homeland or claim their homeland, and the Jewish community is seeing a new type of Zionism that's very different than the settler colonial Zionism that we see in the post-1917 era, where they're Ottomanizing, where they're becoming Ottoman citizens, where they're fighting in the army, where they're trying to lobby on behalf of the Jewish community in Palestine to be autonomous Jewish community, national community, which doesn't equal borders. It doesn't equal an independent state. This is something completely new. But when you go back, to, whether to, you go back to the newspaper Philistine, you go back to the newspaper Hachirut, the Hebrew newspaper, or you go to the Ottoman newspaper, which are now being opened up, and now we have a search engine. Remember, before we didn't have search engines. Now you plug in words, and you can get, you write Zionism, which is Zionism. You're going to get 60, 80 hits in Ottoman newspapers. No one's looked about this. Ottoman anti-Semitism, I work on that. No one's looked at this. We looked at a person named Abu Ziyad Tafik, and now we're transforming it to Ali Kamal. How did I find about Ali Kamal? He turns out to this, be this big liberal that's later killed in the early 1920s within uh, internal Turkish conflict. He was uh, editor of a newspaper during the late Ottoman era. He was exiled. I find in the Jewish Chronicle they write about him. I found a small little thing. We, this Ali Kamal said something about anti-Semitism. Then I go to the Hebrew newspaper in Jerusalem, three Hebrew newspapers, and everyone's saying, but we thought Hebrew was a, de a dead language, and it only after Israel became a you know, spoken language, and only because Eli Eliezer bin Yehuda. No, they had three newspapers. Everyone's writing in Hebrew during this period. You go to the newspapers, and they talk about Ali Kamal, and they say which newspapers to look at in the Ottoman, and they're, they're quoting Ottoman newspapers. So what you do is, you, you're able to knit together a comprehensive picture of Palestine, whether it's through Philistine saying Jews have, have the, the Ottoman Jews or the Jewish immigrants are getting too much power, and in Tel Aviv they set up a small prison that's not legal. And then you get the Ottoman documents investigating it. And you get the Jewish paper saying that's not true. And then you get a final report saying in the end there was something there, but it really didn't happen as it was claimed in the first newspaper. So what we see is we're getting topics, we're talking about topics, and I'll end by saying the biggest topic that we didn't know about was the archaeological dig there in 1911. The, the, what, what I coined the Haram al-Sharif incident. So Haram al-Sharif is the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount incident, and we didn't know about it. Why? Because it had nothing to do with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's one of the biggest events. Captain Parker, an English team, comes to Palestine and digs and searches for the Ark. What does that remind you of? Exactly. It's the Indiana, it's the original Indiana Jones story. We know that for sure. And now this year, four books came out on it. Four books. But my article was the first one to get Ottoman documents. And there's about a 100-page, 120-page dossier. Most, most dossiers in the Ottoman archives are two or three pages. This is the 120 pages. Okay? And I said, how did we not know about it? Archaeologists know about Captain Parker. They all talk about him. He did the Parker Tunnels. Us in Palestinian studies, we don't know about it. But then we go by the newspaper. Newspapers are filled. The Arabic newspapers are filled with it. The, the, the Hebrew newspapers filled with it. Ottoman papers filled with it. New York Times filled with it. 
London Times filled with it. They have a delegation from India that comes to research it. It's huge. Everyone knows about it. But historians didn't know about it because we were over-obsessed with that Palestinian-Israeli conflict, that we missed other greater things. Now, I look at it and I argue through that we see the first moment where you have a, a sort of a Pal Palestinians defending the homeland or making claim over the homeland, which has nothing to do with Zionism. It has fears of British imperialism. So that's what I brought in from that. So we really need to, there's so much more work out there, but we're a few scholars. And I think over time, more and more people um, with Ottoman language, Ottoman Turkish, we would say, are, are studying Palestine also. So it's good. Yeah, the field is developing, definitely. You mentioned this a little bit in passing, but I want to go into a little more of it. Uh, you split your time between the U.S., Israel, and Turkey. And more recently, you've been enjoying Portugal quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> what are the biggest adjustments you make going between countries? Do you feel integrated in these societies? Or is there, there just something that like sets you apart or that you notice that's a little different? Well, I think everywhere I fit in, but I don't fit in. I think everywhere I fit in to some extent. I mean, in Israel, I'm an immigrant originally. Uh, my daughter lives there. I go there often. I have my personal connections. She was born in Turkey, so that also complicates it in terms of connections to, to, to Turkey. She's 23 now. What I would say is that, yeah, everywhere I feel absolutely comfortable. The place that I least for years felt comfortable was New York because I never dreamed of living in the U.S. It was for employment and hopes to get better jobs over there. And that's why I, I kept going back and forth. But I, I learned to, what do you call it? I learned to make peace with the fact in New York and I built a life here and everything. Um, and I like New York. New York is a really cool place. Brooklyn is, it's cool. I went to Berlin and I, and I always wanted to go to Berlin. I, was, I refused to go to Berlin when I, in 2010 or 11 because I said, if I go to Berlin, I won't finish my, my book ever. I'll just, I got my dissertation, I'll just go there and you know, cool city, have fun and forget everything. Not Palestine, Israel, not Turkey. I can speak Turkish there, all that stuff. But I refused to, and it's good I, it's good I didn't go there. Because after I went there, I said, well, you know, I love Berlin, but Brooklyn's not half bad either, <laughs> you know. It's a, and teach at Brooklyn College is, is I wouldn't say a blessing, because I don't talk in terms like that, but it's really, once again, cool. You know, we have students from all over. As some of you have seen, I'm able to speak in multiple languages in classes. So I can speak in Arabic, I can speak in... Hebrew, I can speak in English, Turkish, gibberish, everything, right? I can, in my own language, right? I go back and forth. Some students, after the, after the 2013 Gezi Park protest, I had maybe 15, um, 15 students, Turkish students, and five non-Turkish students in my class. So the non-Turkish students started getting offended, saying, well, why are you, we don't understand what you're saying. I said, don't worry, I'll tell you what I'm saying. But now you know what it feels like for many of the immigrants when they're here. You know, they don't understand everything sometimes. So now you'll get a little taste of it. Okay, so that became sort of a laughing joke and we had a really fun time. So I get everything here in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn in that sense, I get that. I, I have, it's, it is a great place to be. I don't want to use the word cosmopolitan because I don't, I don't really think it's a cosmopolitan city. It's very divided by neighborhood. But yeah, we get everything at Brooklyn College. And Brooklyn College has become much more diverse in the last Five years, I would say. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a different place, and I'm hoping more and more that we get people from outside Brooklyn because I think that brings something very unique to, to the school. Now, with, with Israel, because I'm a citizen, as I stated before, you know, usually I, I, my blog was named purposely uh, way back in 2010, New York, Tel Aviv, Istanbul. And I didn't say Israel, Turkey, and U.S. Usually I say Istanbul, Tel Aviv, New York. And sometimes I say Istanbul, Tel Aviv, Brooklyn now, after, especially after COVID. Who goes to Manhattan anymore, right? I'm still one of the old timers that I say, I'm going to New York. Like last week I went there for the whole day. I was like, this is something cool. I felt like a tourist. You know, I haven't been there for a whole day where I've been to Istanbul maybe 60 days during COVID. And, you know, and Tel Aviv, the same amount, right? So, I, so let's say Istanbul, Tel Aviv, Brooklyn. Tel Aviv, I love, absolutely love Tel Aviv. I think it's an amazing city. It's a warm city. It's on the sea. I'm able to swim, which I don't do often. I only do it once or twice when I'm there. I'm not a big swimmer. But I love having the, the, the warm sand beach. Here in New York, I don't swim in Brighton Beach or 
for better or for worse. Yeah, for better or for worse. So there are nice beaches farther up and stuff like that. I don't have time for that. I don't, I don't have time when I'm here. When I'm here, I work mostly. So Tel Aviv, I, I like that. As since the last couple of years, my daughter's lived in Jerusalem. I've always loved Jerusalem. I think it's an amazing city. And when I did a study abroad there, um, in the second week we talked about study abroad, because I think, give it a plug, I took students there. And I really like being in Jerusalem because it's something different for me. I was in Haifa as an undergrad. I lived in Tel Aviv before that. I lived after that. It, once again, it's just a nice city to be in. Uh, unfortunately, it's very, very expensive. It's very expensive. But since my daughter was, she goes to, uh, to one of the schools in Jerusalem, I've been able to be in Jerusalem more as an excuse. And hopefully, uh, when I'm on sabbatical, I'll be able to spend a, a couple months there. And I really like Jerusalem uh, with, uh, with, with everything that comes with it. Now, Istanbul, absolutely. Like the other cities, I have a problem that I don't leave cities. I've never been to upstate New York in my life. I once rented a car to Binghamton. I rented a car in the morning, I came back in the evening. I gave a talk, I had dinner, and I came home at like 11.30 at night. I left at 8 in the morning, came out at 11.30 at night. Because that's, uh, I, I have a syndrome that after I, I leave cities, I, I get a little nervous that I, I want to be in a, in a city. But Istanbul, so I don't leave that much. Of course, I've been, I lived there two years in Ankara, and I've, I've traveled the country and been able to go to different areas. But I really, really like Istanbul. And Istanbul is... Um, especially the neighborhood I, li- I live in uh, is one of my favorite neighborhoods. It's a neighborhood where you, where you have different uh, religious groups. You have a di- very, very diverse uh, neighborhood. So I, I, I really feel home in neighborhoods more than I feel home in cities. Um, and when I, when I go there, like I don't leave cities, I don't leave my neighborhoods usually. I usually stay in one or two neighborhoods, and it's very hard to pull me out of there. But when I'm there, uh, I, yeah, I feel like I belong Definitely to, I have a life there, I have my friends there, I have family friends that I've had for 20 years. Think about it, I got my place in Istanbul, it's been 20 years now, it's 2023, and I'm covering the elections, well, we can talk about the elections, but I'm covering the elections. I've been to every election almost since 2002 in Turkey. So I was counting, it was like seven elections, and then, then I forgot the municipal elections. So I've been by far to the majority of them. So I know the city very well. I know what's going on. I take study abroad there also. So yeah, so I, I, have a, I, I really, really like Istanbul. I think it's one of the, the most amazing cities. And once again, the fact that I'm not a citizen there, the fact that I care about it as if I am a citizen, care about it in, in ways that you couldn't even explain, um, which I've written about in, in the past also here and there, also in, within journalism. Yeah, so I, I feel like it, uh, for me, it's just a bus ride. Look at it, it's 10 hours, Turkish Airlines, it's a bus ride. You go, you get in, I sit, and I get there 10, 10 hours later. The airport, the new airport's a bit farther, so I have to go, that makes unease, and they've recently opened the metro to the new airport, so that'll make it easier, because I, I, I prefer taking public transportation, always. You don't want to be locked up in a car. I haven't driven, I haven't owned a car Besides grad school in Chicago, I think I had to have a car. So very rarely, I don't. Besides taxis, I think it was a year and a half I hadn't been in a car until recently. I don't like to be closed up in a little little shell. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a single approach to teaching every class? Does it vary with each one? I, I pretty much, what can a student look forward to coming into one of your classes? So first of all, it's exciting. I think they're exciting. They're not boring. I've been known to make swings in classes from this way to that way. Uh, Students are always prepared for it. Uh, I prepare them in advance. Everything is written in the syllabus and that changes. They always can keep the original option. But I like to meet the students before I I actually finish the syllabus and sort of feel the students, what they're interested in. And that way, after the first few weeks, I started adding articles, take articles out, things like this. Carter, you were in the class I did on Jewish history where it was a modern Jewish history, European Jewish history, was the first time I taught it. It was in the books here, and we wanted to keep it going, and no one has taught it for a long time. So I said, sure, I'll teach it. Um, I know the topic quite well, de facto doing Israeli history for years and Jewish history, and I taught for years at synagogues when I was in grad school, so I know narratives of it, but I never taught it. So I said, let's learn together. I was like preparing, it was like grad school, like I was preparing hours before every night, reading this, it was, a, it was an intensive reading class also, and I warned the students before this intensive reading, because I really can't stand up there and lecture, 
right? I can't stand up in the lecture hour and a half. I have to go back to the book and read it, and then we discuss the readings. So that was uh, one of my approaches. Colloquiums, I'm rethinking my colloquiums. Really, the students are advanced students, and I shouldn't teach them like they're the first year or second year students at all, right? They, they're advanced students, and I should start treating more like a less tedious work and look at that main project at the end. That should be the thing. So I'm, I'm constantly renegotiating my classes. And after I finished my book, I was able to do that, I have to say. So we're at the stage where now, and during COVID, you know, COVID wasn't great at all, but being on, on, online for uh, you know, one year, two years was too much. But I discovered certain readings that really appealed to students and others that didn't. And that was the time that I could take them out. I would say that my Modern Middle East class, the one now that, that you're in, and the one that I did online, the online class was the best class I ever had at Brooklyn College almost. Now, most of my classes, I was very unhappy during the pandemic because we need to be in the classroom. I'm a believer to be in the classroom. But the dynamics were so good in that class, we didn't feel that. We, we felt that we were like we were in a classroom. So it, it happens. You know, sometimes students, you get a group of students and there's a, a, a dynamic. What I hope from all my students is that they come out friends in my class. It's funny to me when people say, oh, you teach controversial topics. Everything's controversial. What do you mean? I always say everything's controversial. Why is this more controversial? Because there's the word Palestine in it and Israel in it? No, we have students. We have Palestinian students. We have, you know, children of Palestinians, children of Israelis. We have, you know, Syrian Jews that speak Arabic also at home and Hebrew at home. We have a very, you know, diverse groups. I won't, you know, once I said, you know, how are people connected? First generation, second generation, no connection. You can't do that. Because then I find out that, you know, a, a student of Haitian background went to a church here on Flatbush and was raised believing Israel was, was, was the promised land. And it was a deep believer in that, right? So I, I, you really can't know who your students are. But you know that dynamic when they start getting along and they start talking to each other after class. And that's what I like. That's, that's exactly what that's approach I like. To, to, and I'm bringing more music and, and more uh, visuals and what I call chit-chat, because it's during the chit-chat that we start learning things, actually. Yeah, so that's sort of my uh, approach. It's always transforming, always. Um, but students know what they get right away. The, the syllabus is very clear. It's not extra hard, but it's not easy either. And I'm becoming uh, more strict with uh, small things, like getting your name on the right side and the date and a title. Because in the end, I'll finish here, what I always say to my students, you're all going to the work field. And whether you're going to be working for the State Department, which I encourage, I'm not a fan of it at all, but if, you know, we have students that are fans of it, go and apply to the State Department. Go and apply, go to Istanbul and start writing journalism if that's what you want to do. I don't care where, you know, you can also go to Riyadh, I don't care, it doesn't matter where. You can go to Thailand and start writing. But if you do that, you'll succeed. In the end, I'm a, I'm a true believer. But also, also if you're a fire person or a police person, you're going to need, need, need to know how to write up reports. So writing is, a, uh, is very, very important. That, that, that's what, unfortunately, we, so many students don't get in high school. And we have to catch them being in a public institution. We have to catch it here. So across the board, it doesn't matter if you, what you're going to be in your life. You're going to have to, you have to know how to write. And you have to know how to put your name on the, when it says the left side, you have, to follow the, you have to know how to follow directions. So these basic things, yes, I have to do. Other schools, we might not have to do that. It's part of Brooklyn, and it, it, comes, with, it, comes, with, uh, it comes with the job. Twitter, you have built up quite the following. Uh, you have over 60,000 followers who find you as a really reliable source of Middle Eastern news, and uh, your, your opinions are taken very seriously. And with all of this notoriety, how much time do you put into your work on the internet and on top of that was it a learning process or were you just always this good at it yeah it was it was a learning process people only retweet if it's good you know you can get a lot of retweets once or twice from cheap shots unimportant messaging but to build up you know every follower in that sense you have a sort of a contract i believe with that that follower now i try to interact with as many people as possible sometimes when a tweet uh, goes viral recently, especially in the 
let what's happening, the judicial coup in Israel, a lot of people. And I really, I do Middle East, I do a lot of Middle East topics, and I try to do topics from international topics, but I do mostly um, Israel, Palestine, and Turkey, and I do it with a, a more of a left view. So I think that people that follow me want that. They, they want to, to hear a certain take, a certain perspective. Just like some right-wing people have followers, I'm left and I'm very outspoken across the board. But I also know my limits. Keep people believing in what you're writing and stay true to what you want to do. So that's very, very important. How much time I spend? I've learned over the last year, to, especially since after the pandemic. As you know, both of you know and you see me, I'm here almost 9 to 5. I treat my, my academic job to be a 9 to 5 job almost nowadays. And I find that when I go home around 7 usually, so it's more like 9 to 6, I teach two days a week, I'm here on Fridays, I watch intensive amounts of, of different TVs from international TVs here on all the time. But at 8 in the evening, I don't turn on my computer anymore. Only if there's something really big. Something big happens then I want to report it immediately and get the news out there and something like that. What I, what I will say is that, you know, besides the trolls that come with it, and that's either within, especially in the, the Turkish realm, but it's becoming more and more uh, within uh, talking about Israeli politics as it's become more polarized. I mean, the Israeli society is torn at the seams right now. I get more and more trolls from them. And trolls, I will reveal, sometimes know how to hit you. They know, they know how to, they say the worst things and they're like, that really hit, you know, like, wow. And you want to curse back at them. But I just usually just block. With the ones that want to engage, when a tweet goes viral, sometimes I'm not able to because I don't see it even. Because it's like a, it's like a ticker feed, you call it, what was it? You know, the, the news feed that just comes one after the other. You, it's constantly updating notifications. You, you can't even read what people are writing five days later or six days later. And that, that I miss sometimes, you know, I'm not able to engage. But usually I try to engage with everyone. And as long as they're respectful, they have a different point of view, I answer. And, and I think that's also very important because I like the human part of it. You know, I really like the human engagement. And I've been lucky because I meet a lot of people there. I've met very few people face to face from Twitter. But you know that like the terrible earthquake in Turkey and Syria, I immediately said, I can't do Syria, I can do Turkey. And that is, you, you feel that you're doing something more, right? You're doing something more, you're getting news out, and you're able to direct people to where they can contribute money, donate money to help uh, victims. Um, and that is a, that's a huge power that you have right there, right? So I really researched, I found one or two people, one of them was a professor at NYU. She was donating money directly to families. So I put all my energy into that because we could actually see where that money is going. And I was able to help a, a family that I know also uh, that had contacted me. They needed help and I was able to direct them to her. And yeah, so that, in that sense, Twitter is sometimes really fulfilling. I even think in my book, my followers on Twitter and Facebook less so now. We don't, Facebook is not really there anymore. But I'll, I'll end by saying that I understand why there's the Facebook people and there's Twitter people. And I'm really Twitter because I don't have time to go into these long, you know, hard search, soul searching conversations. No, we're dealing with a topic. We write about that topic. We move on to a new, a new topic. So Facebook is great for the ones that just love to dig into it. I'll end by saying that Instagram I want to develop more because I love photography. But the last uh, year or two, I've sort of slowed that down. And maybe I'll go back, to, go back to it more. But for now, just Twitter. You know, our worlds are shaken up by politicians all the time. All the time in, in, in Turkey, uh, now with the judicial coup in uh, Israel. Our world's Trump in the U.S., right? Our worlds are shaken up. We wake up in the morning and politicians who think they're, they have more power than they should, they ruin our lives sometimes. From the moment you wake up, but I try not to look at, I try not to look just at that because, you know, I'm trying to do something different. But when it came to Twitter, when the new owner came in, you know, Elon Musk, and things aren't working the same way as they were and things are breaking down and 
And you're like, wow, now I have to deal with it here also. So in that sense, hopefully things will settle down and it will get, it's sort of smoothed out. But yesterday there was, you know, during, right during the opposition candidates being announced and suddenly Twitter in Turkey and suddenly Twitter like breaks down for like two hours. I'm like, no, not now. This is when we need it, you know. So that uh, hopefully things will smooth out with, with Twitter also uh, because it's a great site for getting information, for getting news. Do you have any current work that you're looking forward to? Maybe new classes or ongoing research, your next project? Great that you ask. I started officially in December, January. I didn't travel for the first time. I sat in my office. I'm working on a book on the Erdogan years in Turkey, the last 20 years. It was going in the directions of looking at resistance movements within Turkey and how they remain resilient in a growing authoritarian society, state, versus looking at what went wrong during the Erdogan years. And after the earthquake, I think what went wrong during the Erdogan years might be the overall theme of the book with the resistance in there as a chapter. So this year, up until January, even September, I hope to have a draft done. That's what you'll, you'll start seeing me here in nights also, writing at nights um, and mornings. I might be, maybe go to elections to cover them during the spring break I've decided just recently. And then I had study abroad, and I'm doing study abroad specifically in May to be in Istanbul, to be able to meet many of these groups again, because I bring my students to different groups and professors, and I'll only be thinking about Turkey during those three weeks, only thinking about Istanbul and my students and teaching them and, and, and meeting new peoples and going places and rethinking different ideas. So hopefully by September, December, that's going to be worked out. And then I'm going to a massive new project on rethinking the whole Jewish community in Palestine during the late Ottoman era. It's going to be an extension of my book, but it's going to connect it with questions in Istanbul much more. And it's going to really hopefully give a completely new narrative that no one's had before and hopefully shake up that world. You know, the, the thing is, I'm in Middle East studies, there's Jewish studies, there's this, this Israeli studies, and I'm hoping that this will infiltrate those much more, that they will seep over into those much more. Um, because when I was younger, I was very obsessed, I think, with doing the other, okay? I don't know what that means, doing the other, but Palestinians, the work on Palestinians, it's underwritten. But later on, I understood that, yes, there's so much on the Israeli Jewish community or what in Palestine, the Jewish community in Palestine, or the Yeshuv, we, we call it, that that really needs uh, work. But that will take, that's going to be like a three-year, four-year project. So that's why the Turkey project, you know, is going to go in quickly, and then I'll go to this major one, which I hopefully will start research during my sabbatical next year in the archives in Israel and Turkey. Thank you for answering all our serious questions and everything. We just have five more very quick Fun questions that is no thinky, just whatever pops into your head first. I'm ready. All right. What is your favorite book? Right now, I don't, you know, I, you, I thought about that because you mentioned that you might ask some questions like this. I don't really have a favorite book, I would tell you. I like, I like history books. I'm reading a book right now called Losing Istanbul, and I'm really excited to read it. So every book that I, I choose to read when I'm reading it, uh, you know, then I'm going to, but that's what I'm reading right now. It's called Losing Istanbul. It's about Arabs following World War I. It's written by Professor Mustafa Manawi. And I'm really looking forward to, I've just started it. I'm, I'm completely just dived into it. So that's what I'm reading now. Uh, do you have a favorite food? Foods are difficult for me because I bring food mostly every day. I don't eat out that much. I try not to eat out too much. I mean, in New York, it would probably be bar food. <laughs> you know, just junk food. Uh, I just love it. You know, when I everywhere because I travel a lot, I love Turkish food. But when I'm in Turkey, I I, I try to eat at home also. I, I eat a lot at home. I love going out to what they call mehane, and tavern and your mezes, opening up a table they call it. You have raka, the drink, and you spend four or five hours with friends talking over food. So it's more for me. It's not the food. It's the people that you sit with. Definitely. Uh, in Israel, if I did that, I would be completely broke. Completely if I just opened up a table for five hours. And just, in New York also, by the way. Absolutely. New York has got ridiculously expensive. Ridiculously expensive. That I don't really enjoy going out when I come home and, you know, a few of us go out and the bill comes $500. Uh, 
do you know, and, and you've had one or two drinks and you've, the food wasn't that great. And so that, it's, it's a problem with this thing. Um, and, but Tel Aviv, I, just, I love street food also. I love, you know, I love uh, different types of food. So I don't have a favorite, I don't have a, a favorite food, but I do like, uh, yeah, I like what I like and I don't like what I don't like. And I can't tell you more than that because I don't know really what I like. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you have a favorite non-work activity? Non-work activity, being with friends, going out by myself sometimes also. I love going out. I love going out. I'm a night person, so I can spend all night out. Uh, I can't see the sunrise. I don't like seeing sunrises. But I like going out uh, intensive uh, at times. But as long as I get back before, uh, you know, I like meeting uh, the holy people when they come home. When they go out. I mean, they go out and I'm coming home. Uh, yeah, that's, what it, that's, that's, that's considered a fun night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we greet each other on the street. Good morning, they're either going to the synagogue or the mosque or to the church or something like that. Once I flew into Germany, because I'm not all night, I, I don't, when I see sun, sunrises, I see all these people coming out of club at 10 in the morning. And I was like, I was like, wow. And the people were going to church at the same time. There was a church very nearby. So I said, that, that would be pushing it for me. But yeah, I, I like going out with friends and I like also walking. I love walking. Every day I walk to school and everything, so I, I love that. Look at new neighborhoods and going out to clubs and stuff like that, yeah. Well, what's your favorite thing to do in New York City specifically? Specifically, exactly what I just told you. Just yeah, just same everywhere, it's the same. It's every, it's a, it has to do with going out and, and then walking home or walking there. Once I was going to uh, Williamsburg or uh, what is it, uh, the other big neighborhood, I, I can't believe it, bed -Stuy. Okay, not bed -Stuyed. Bushwick. Bushwick. I don't really go to Bushwick, it's too far for me. So once I, I look at Uber and I, the, the train was like an hour and a half there. And I look at Uber, it was like from my old house, it's three miles. So I said, oh, I'll just walk, you know. And I got there almost at the same time, a little longer. But I stopped on my way, stopped on a few places on the way to see new neighborhoods and stuff like that. Uh, and the, the, uh, the ultimate question, uh, what is your favorite music genre? So music's hard also because I like, I like music in all languages and all, you know, I love Hebrew music. I absolutely love Hebrew music. But I like certain, you know, different types. Uh, I'm a radio, I, in, in Israel more I'm a radio person. I, I turn the radio and I, I can listen. Uh, in Turkish I have my, my, I like Turkish rock at times. I love Turkish pop. Turkish pop is its own genre that we, we learn about in our class. But I like folk music in Turkish also, you know, the old saws and um, when my students go abroad and study abroad, I try to take them to different places so they can see the many different types of music. And the U.S., like, you know, I was, when I was young, I loved, the, you know, British 80s, whether it was death punk or whether it was new wave or what we talked about that in the past. Yeah, I like I liked, I liked that. But I like things that are happening now also. Yeah, so I, I'm pretty easy going on, on the music thing. What I don't like is I don't like, and I don't like, like, hard rock heavy metal, like that, you want to find me, or too much techno, you know, I like words, and I'll finish by saying when I listen to music, I, you know, I don't do podcasts much, because when I walk outside, I don't listen to music, I don't listen to music on the subway, I don't listen to podcasts, when I'm walking, I like to absorb everything around me, but I sit here at least, at least two or three hours a week, and then watch music videos, and so I'm more visual, like I love to have it there, but not just in the background when I'm working. When I, when, I, when I do music, I go three or four hours and listen. But I just sit here. Just sit and listen and click, 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 click. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Professor Fishman. This was a fantastic interview. Thanks so much. Yeah, this, was this, nice. this is a treat. Thanks so much. so much. Fun, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Our professor podcast was recorded with the permission of the Brooklyn College History Department and our student interviewees. We would like to thank both the students and the faculty for their contributions.